Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome to the third presentation of the President's uh, special lecture series on pandemics. Uh, I am delighted that I have the opportunity to say hello to you once again and um, in, introduce our uh, third speaker uh, to you. I, I must say uh, this pandemic has uh, created a very challenging environment for all of us for an extended period of time now, getting close to nine months. Um, but if it has done one good thing, it is that it has created an opportunity for us to um, get to know and uh, learn from the wisdom and experiences of uh, uh, some phenomenal uh, scientists and, and speakers in this lecture series. Uh, obviously, the era of uh, the coronavirus pandemic has been among the most challenging periods <clears throat> in recent history, both for higher education as a whole and uh, Stevens, as well as for society at large. As a community of scholars and academics, we um, strive to understand this experience in the context of history and through other lenses as well, science, engineering, information technology, economics and, and others. <clears throat> Earlier in the semester, we were fascinated by a talk by Dr. Chitali of DARPA on preventing pandemics, tools of the trade. And last month, we were very fortunate to host Dr. Snowden of Yale University for his talk entitled COVID-19, Why Were We So Unprepared? <clears throat> we are equally excited today to have Dr. Maya Majumdar uh, here today for her presentation on modeling the COVID-19 pandemic using statistical and machine learning methods. It is uh, clearly evident that many people are interested in this topic with the large number of uh, participants who are continuing to pour in and, uh, and, uh, and join us in the talk. Dr. Majumdar is a member of the latter rank faculty at the Computational Health Informatics Program <clears throat> uh, based out of Harvard Medical School and Boston Children's Hospital and a recent graduate of the Engineering Systems Program at MIT's Institute for Data Systems and Society. In between her uh, graduate studies and her current position, uh, Dr. Majumdar spent a year at the Health Policy Data Science Lab at Harvard Medical School's uh, Healthcare Policy Department as a postdoctoral fellow. During her master's and doctoral studies at MIT, she was funded through a graduate fellowship at uh, uh, HealthMap. Prior to Dr. Majumdar's arrival at MIT, she earned a, a Bachelor of Science in Engineering Science and a Master of Public Health in epidemiology and biostatistics at Tufts University. Uh, while at Tufts, Dr. Majumdar was a, a field researcher with, a, with the International Center for Diarrheal Disease Research, uh, Bangladesh, where she worked with clinic patients and, um, and their data to learn how to better um, communicate their stories. Uh, Dr. Majumdar's current research interests involve probabilistic modeling, artificial intelligence, and systems epidemiology in the context of public health, with a focus on, cash, uh, on um, causal interference of infectious disease surveillance using digital disease data. She also enjoys exploring novel techniques for data procurement, writing about data for the general public, and creating meaningful data vis visualization techniques. As of January 2020, almost uh, the very beginning of this year, Dr. Majumdar has been engaged in pandemic response efforts and is a leading expert in COVID-19 epidemiology. So without further ado, I'm going to give the rest of the time to Dr. Majumdar. Please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Maya Majumdar. Thank you. Dr. Majumdar. Great, so let me share my screen. Okay, all right. So fabulous. Let me just see. 
Great. Okay. So hi, everyone. My name is Maima Jumder, and today I will be discussing a few of my research group's recent studies at the intersection of machine learning and public health. I've been applying machine learning methods to public health problems for about half a decade now, and have responded to several global infectious disease crises since 2014, including Zika in Central and South America, Ebola in West Africa, and many others. But my ongoing research regarding the COVID-19 pandemic will definitely be at the front and center of my talk today. We'll kick things off with a bit of context regarding the ongoing pandemic. Then from there, we'll move on to three of my research group's recent studies that employ machine learning methods to better understand COVID-19. Because we have limited time today, I'll keep my overview of each study fairly high level, covering the research questions first, then the methodology used to address them, followed by findings, policy recommendations, and related work. For those who want to learn more, though, all three studies have been published already and are open access, and I've included citations throughout my slide deck to make it as easy as possible to find them. I'll also take a brief break after the first of the three studies to take a few questions from the audience, but I'll also try to reserve enough time for an extended Q&A session at the end of the session as well, and we'll aim for about 20 to 30 minutes of Q&A total throughout the lecture. That said, feel free to shoot me questions on Twitter as well if you prefer. My handle is at the top left of most of these slides. All right, now let's get started. So as many of us on the line are aware, there have been nearly 64 million cases of COVID-19 reported worldwide since late 2019, caused by the novel coronavirus SARS-CoV-2, which is shown on the right here. These cases comprise only a fraction of total infections, though, due to something we call underdocumentation. Underdocumentation has many causes, including the fact that many SARS CoV 2 infections are mild or asymptomatic in nature, as well as insufficient volume of lab testing in the early days of the pandemic, a problem that persists in under resourced communities both in the US and around the world even now. Another reason for underdocumentation in the early days of the pandemic was simply because cases were often misclassified. The earliest cases of COVID-19 presented as pneumonia, which can have many causes beyond SARS-CoV-2, and may thus have been diagnosed as something else at the time. As is an issue with any novel pathogen, there's a learning curve associated with discovering even the most basic attributes of its characteristics in humans and its behavior in populations. For instance, the transmissions of SARS-CoV-2 started in Hubei, China in late November 2019. It wasn't until January 2020 that sustained human-to-human -human transmission was suspected, which is when my group began researching the novel coronavirus and its epidemiological characteristics. Our early work involved assessing the transmissibility potential, often described as a basic reproduction number or R0 associated with SARS-CoV-2 in Hubei, China. The basic reproduction number is often defined as the average number of secondary infections caused by a single index case in a fully susceptible population. As a result, it is population specific and varies across contexts. One can imagine, for example, populations where individuals have many daily contacts may exhibit higher values of R0 than populations where individuals have fewer daily contacts. In a population where R0 for a given pathogen is estimated to be greater than one, we expect that the pathogen has epidemic or pandemic potential. However, because R0 can't be directly observed, we need to model it. There are a lot of different models that can estimate R0, but early in the pandemic, we had so little data available that we decided to take a simple statistical phenomenological approach to its estimation. Phenomenological models are strictly descriptive in nature. In other words, they can't tell us anything about the underlying mechanism of disease transmission in the population. However, their advantage is that they require very little data to parameterize. My group's estimate for R0 was the first on record, but was quickly followed by several others, shown on right through a study we conducted in February. Though there was variability across the estimates, the mean was consistent across studies, indicating that the R0 associated with SARS-CoV-2 in Hubei, China, in the earliest days of the pandemic, was likely in the ballpark of two to three, which is, of course, much higher than one. 
As the epidemic in Hubei quickly turned into a global pandemic, however, my group started to wonder just how different R0 was across locations and how the various non-pharmaceutical interventions that were implemented around the world would impact transmission in the months ahead. Especially as new waves of transmission begin in response to calendar events like the holiday season, this is particularly relevant. Given the complexity of new questions we were interested in, we decided to take a more complex machine learning approach in the form of agent-based modeling to address them. However, agent-based models, or ABMs, haven't been the only machine learning application my group has explored within the context of the pandemic to date. Prompted by how quickly the basic reproduction number studies shown on the right of this slide were produced back in early 2020, we also became increasingly curious about the speed at which the scientific community was working to fill existing knowledge gaps to better understand the novel coronavirus. We were especially interested in understanding whether certain fields within the broad umbrella of outbreak research were experiencing more rapid information generation than others. So to answer this question, we turned to natural language processing or NLP techniques like principal component analysis and latent Dirichlet allocation to sift through the thousands and thousands, and truly I mean thousands, of new studies that have been produced in response to the pandemic. During this bibliometric analysis though, my group became increasingly interested about how gaps in knowledge might also lend themselves to the proliferation of misinformation. Because of the political context of the pandemic in the US especially, Americans have been particularly vulnerable to misinformation pertaining to the pandemic. Thus, with an eye towards developing better monitoring and mitigation strategies for public health and misinformation, my group tapped into novel data streams like news media data and search query data to investigate misinformation events here in the US. These three broad research areas, ABMs for epidemic dynamics, PCA and LDA for bibliometrics, and news media and search query data for event-specific surveillance of misinformation events comprise a few of my group's core scientific interests. And today I'll be covering three recently published studies that offer a taste of the work that we're doing within each of them. So without further ado, let's get started with ABMs for epidemic dynamics. The paper I'll be presenting in this research area is cited at the bottom of the slide for those who are interested in reading it and was recently published in the Proceedings of the National Academies of Science. In this paper, there were three big picture questions that we aim to answer through our agent-based modeling approach across three different populations of interest. Hubei, China, where the pandemic began, Lombardy, Italy, one of the hardest hit locations worldwide in the earliest days of the pandemic, and New York City, one of the hardest hit locations here in the US. Recalling the context dependence of the transmissibility potential associated with the given pathogen, the first question we wanted to answer was, how does r not vary across locations? Second, recalling issues with documentation of infections that I mentioned at the very beginning of this presentation, how does documentation rate vary across locations. And finally, recalling the number of non-pharmaceutical intervention policies that have been deployed around the world since the beginning of the pandemic and how said policies may impact transmission in the months ahead, what is the impact of varying policy recommendations during a new wave of infections across locations? Our choice of an agent-based modeling approach to answer these big picture questions is perhaps best explained by digging into what an ABM actually is within the context of epidemic dynamic modeling. ABMs in our case can be best described as a mechanistic infectious disease model that simulate individual people or agents who are assigned predefined characteristics based off of existing data on the population or populations of interest, including things like region specific contact matrices, household structure, age, sex, and comorbidities, among many, many other things. The description cards shown on this slide describe some of the attributes that are defined for a given agent or individual to address the aforementioned variability that we expect across populations for our three questions of interest. By defining each agent's characteristics based off of population specific distributional data, we're able to simulate epidemics within a synthetic version of each population, including how interventions may curb disease transmission in said populations. Clearly, ABMs require a lot more data and computing power to parameterize than simpler models, which is part of why we didn't use this kind of approach early on in the pandemic. 
However, unlike simpler models, they can lend important insights into more complex questions like the ones we were interested in answering for this particular study. To simulate epidemics in each of our populations of interest, we fed the agents for any given population through a susceptible, exposed, infectious, and removed, or SEIR style model, as is shown here. We used contact matrix and household structure data specific to each population of interest to inform transitions from the susceptible state to the exposed state, and we further partitioned our infectious state into four categories pre-symptomatic, mild, severe, and critical, each of which was assigned a probability of transitioning to one of the two removed state categories, recovered or deceased. Folks on the line are probably familiar with SEIR style models of the traditional compartmental variety, which are typically defined by ordinary differential equations, or ODEs, as many of us are familiar with, and treat each member of a given compartment as identical to one another. In these simpler models, all members of the susceptible compartment have the same probability of transitioning into the exposed compartment. All exposed members have the same probability of transitioning to the infectious compartment, so on and so forth. These kinds of simple models are popular because they're much less computationally intensive and complex than ABMs. And certainly there are plenty of diverse models that fall within the spectrum between the simplest SEIR style models and the ABM that we're discovering and discussing today. However, they aren't optimized for taking into consideration non-pharmaceutical intervention policies and their impact on transmission, an issue that is particularly important for our three populations of interest, given shelter in place orders that took place in each location. Furthermore, they, meaning the simplest SEIR style models, can't capture the individual level variability that makes agents different from each other an issue that is especially important when considering the fact that intervention uptake occurs at the individual level. In other words, just because a non-pharmaceutical intervention policy is enacted in a given population doesn't mean that every group within that population will comply with it. This was particularly critical in our research interests because we wanted to specifically investigate the impact of age group specific sheltering in place and physical distancing on transmission dynamics during potential new waves of spread in Hubei, Lombardy, and New York City. To parameterize the SEIR model shown on the previous slide for our agent based models, we used a combination of empirical estimates and free parameters, as shown in this table. Notably, the probability of infecting an out of household contact is a free parameter that plays an important role in estimating R0 across locations. Distributions for free parameters like this one were estimated using a Bayesian inference framework by fitting death trajectories for each population of interest against ground truth death trajectory data. Death trajectories were used as opposed to case counts over time because deaths have generally been a more reliable indicator of outbreak progress across locations throughout the pandemic. This is largely because if you die from COVID, you're more likely to be actually documented as a COVID case than if you don't. Though deaths obviously lag behind infections, they were less likely to be documented than non-fatal cases of uh, COVID-19. Uh, and so that said, we did use ground truth data on case counts to estimate the documentation rate across locations by dividing reported case counts by the number of infections as ascertained from our ABM for each location. Our ABM fits against the ground truth daily death data for each population shown in black dots in the three panels in this figure were quite good across locations. The green line shows the median trajectory from our ABMs and the light blue how individual samples from the thousands of simulated epidemics that we ran for each location. The red line indicates when ABMs for each location initiated a reduction in contact across the population in response to non-pharmaceutical intervention policies, such as shelter in place orders that were happening in real life and in real time. These policies were implemented at different times across locations, as is clear from the x-axis for the three panels, because the outbreaks took place at different times across these locations. The factor by which contact was reduced following shelter in place orders varied by location. While information on this parameter was determined empirically from a survey study for Hubei, it was treated as a free parameter for Lombardy and New York, where we didn't at the time of the study have survey studies yet. We did, however, compare our estimates for contact reduction in New York against mobility data from Unicast and found their estimates were fairly similar. 
To further validate our fits against death trajectory ground truth data, we conducted sensitivity analysis under varying assumptions of underdocumentation for deaths, as well as out of sample validation, as is detailed at length in the supplementary materials that accompany this paper. Once we felt fairly assured of our fits against the ground truth death trajectory data, we were able to estimate R naught for each location, as well as the documentation rate. Substantial differences in R naught are visible across locations, as shown in the top left panel, with medians of 2.23 for Hubei, 2.95 in Lombardy, and 3.2 for New York City, thus demonstrating important population level variability. R0 values as estimated through a sensitivity analysis in which deaths were assumed to be underreported in Lombardy and New York City, which unlike Hubei were still developing outbreaks at the time of this analysis, is shown in the bottom left panel. And notably, the relative order of magnitudes across locations remains unchanged. Substantial differences in documentation rate are also visible as shown in the top right panel with consistently low documentation rates across locations. Rates that are further reduced when conducting a sensitivity analysis in which deaths in Lombardy and New York City are once again assumed to be underreported as is shown in the bottom right panel. Despite low documentation rates across locations though, all three populations remain vulnerable to a new wave of infections as of this past summer, which is when this paper was in preparation for publication. More specifically, our models suggest that only 1.3% of Hubei, 13.8% of Lombardy, and 22% of New York City were infected by the end of our modeling periods for each location, the latter of which has since been confirmed empirically via serological survey. Given the susceptibility of all three locations to further transmission of SARS-CoV-2, we investigated the possible impact of various shelter-in-place strategies to curb transmission in, in the event of a new wave, with a focus on age group-specific interventions. Here, each column shows a different level of physical distancing by the population of interest, where contacts between all age groups are reduced by the given percentage of the starting value. The x-axis within each plot shows the results when the given fraction of a single age group shelters in place in addition to physical distancing by the rest of the population. The result of this combination of sheltering and distancing is represented by a bar, where the color of the bar indicates the age group which engaged in sheltering, as shown in the key. The height of the bar yields the total fraction of the population infected or the number of deaths in the population in that scenario. Each row gives the results for a single location where the first two plots show the fraction of the population which is newly infected in the new wave, and the next two plots show the number of deaths which occur. We found that sheltering in place by a single age group had the potential to produce a protective effect against transmission for the entire population, but which age group had the greatest impact varied across our three locations, thus highlighting the importance of capturing heterogeneity both within and across populations. Furthermore, the impact of sheltering in place is itself impacted by the level of physical distancing undertaken by the rest of the non-sheltered population. Here, 50% contact and 75% contact rates, which represent 50% and 25% reductions in numbers of contacts are shown, with starkly different outcomes with respect to infections shown on the left and deaths shown on the right in our three populations of interest. This work suggests that partial population sheltering rather than universal lockdowns combined with physical distancing by the remainder of the population may be a creative solution for re reducing transmission in the months ahead while we wait for herd immunity to kick in with vaccination. But that recommendations regarding who should shelter have to be population specific and that there isn't a one size fits all solution. Given the impact of physical distancing as a supplement to partial population sheltering, we also provided a list of policy recommendations to improve the feasibility of physical distancing in our paper. And we expect that these recommendations will continue to stand even as vaccination begins here in the US. These include, but are not limited to the implementation of shift work, staggering of work shifts, and cohorting of workers in workplaces one-way aisles and age group-based shopping hours for essential businesses such as grocery stores, pharmacies, and so on, uh, staggered admissions for non-essential businesses such as gyms and restaurants, and remote worship services for religious congregations. Further recommendations, including the feasibility of sheltering in place within the work from home paradigm are elaborated upon in the supplementary materials as well for those who may be interested. 
This all said, though, our agent-based modeling structure has been peer-reviewed and it's been published, but we're still working on improving it through related and ongoing work that builds off of the structure I presented today and applies it to other locations of interest. Internationally, we've thus far expanded our model to India, and domestically, we've started work on developing state-level models that incorporate occupation into the agent characteristics as defined for each population of interest. At the state level in the US, we're also working on modeling forthcoming pharmaceutical interventions, including the development of vaccination deployment strategies that exploit transmission heterogeneity. The fact that not all individuals are as likely to contract or spread SARS-CoV-2 as others to inform risk-based immunization. Without question, this is an active area of research where we expect to continue improving upon our published work to better inform the way that we make policy decisions moving forward. And we're excited to see where our ongoing work takes us. With the first of three studies I'll be covering today behind us, let me pause now to briefly take a handful of questions. Uh, there should be plenty of time to answer additional questions at the end of the talk though, so feel free to wait if you'd like to hear the rest of what I have to say first. Dr. Majumdar, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I'd like to ask the uh, participants to please send their questions via the Q&A um, feature of Zoom, uh, and I've already received uh, a couple. Uh, the first question, if you don't mind, I'm going to pose this question. This is a question from uh, one of our participants saying that Johns Hopkins University recently published an article that stated that the number of COVID-19 deaths were overreported and actually uh, she, she has sent a link to this article. Um, so first, have you seen this article? Are you aware of it? And if so, can you make any comments on whether the number of deaths has, has been overreported or not? So I haven't seen the article, though I, I have seen this uh, theory proposed in, in other situations. I think that one of the questions that frequently arises is how do we define a COVID-19 death? And so the example that I frequently give is, for example, let's say somebody gets into a car accident and they have severe blunt force trauma. They appear at the ER and they are in really, really bad shape. And let's say that they pass away and they also happen to test positive for COVID-19 while they're in the hospital. So did this person die from COVID-19 or did they die from the blunt force trauma? So in this case, if this is a fairly young person, person who doesn't have comorbidities, we might feel fairly comfortable saying that this person died from blunt force trauma. However, if we have a situation that's more complex, say, for example, somebody comes into the hospital and they've recently had a stroke and they are older, they have comorbidities, and they also happen to test positive for COVID-19. And while they're in the hospital, they also have severe respiratory failure, so on and so forth. In this situation, the, the situation is much more complex in terms of defining, did this person die from COVID-19 or not? And I think that a lot of the, the struggle that folks are facing right now in terms of trying to decide what is a COVID-19 death versus what is not has to do with this. It has to do with these complexities that emerge when people show up at the hospital. But there are some other issues as well. I think that there are a lot of different ways to define mortality for a pandemic. So I think one of the things that's happening now is on one hand, we're trying to understand the number of direct deaths that are due to SARS-CoV-2 infection, but we're also trying to understand what is the excess mortality associated with this pandemic due to other causes of illness that are potentially going undertreated or underserved because our healthcare systems are overburdened. And I think that making a distinction between these two is really important. So some of what I've seen, at least in, in conversation so far, is that there is a tendency to conflate these two things and they're not the same. So we have on one hand, deaths that are directly due to COVID-19 that might be due to somebody had COVID-19 and they had something else at the same time and we aren't totally sure what to write down on their death certificate. But that's one group of, of mortality that we should be interested in when it comes to this pandemic. The other group is these excess mortality estimations. And I think that for that latter group, excess mortality is very, very difficult to estimate. And it's very difficult to determine what are the indirect 
deaths that are due to this pandemic due to structural failures and our healthcare systems, which are already overburdened. So I'll, I'll leave it with that. I will definitely take a look at this article. I hadn't seen it until today. So I'll uh, definitely take a look and, and see whether I have any further thoughts uh, later on as well. I appreciate it. Actually, I'm going to build on this question and ask you a related question. Have you heard of any statements suggesting that in some other countries, death rate may have been underreported? Yes, definitely. So this is actually the use case that we conduct sensitivity analysis for in our paper, because I think in many ways that's a more likely scenario, at least for direct deaths. And the reason for this, again, is that if you don't have strong diagnostics, it is really difficult to test people to see whether they may have died from this. So it ends up being a situation where going back to the, the example of the person who has the stroke, this person may have a stroke, they come into the hospital, they also have respiratory failure, but they never receive a COVID-19 test. In that situation, their death certificate is pretty straightforward, what's written down. But if you had enough tests, if you had a political will to actually do diagnostics on every single death, that changes what we might see in terms of the number of direct deaths due to COVID-19. So I think that's a, a very likely scenario. So we've seen this in a lot of other epidemics where it's difficult to actually do diagnostics after a person dies. And as a result, you suspect maybe they died from something, but you have no way to know for sure. And we've seen this with a lot of previous epidemics, which is part of why we think that at least for direct deaths, the sensitivity analysis needs to be conducted such that we're expecting underreporting of deaths rather than overreporting. Uh, at the same time, I think that we can say with some assurance that underreporting of deaths is less likely than underreporting of cases, which is why it's still a, a much better measure when trying to fit against a ground truth than, say, cases would be. Got it. Thank you very much. I have two other questions here. Uh, I'll uh, first read the simple one. Uh, which population age group, uh, for which pop population age group isolation works better? That's a good question. So this depends on the context of the population, which is what I mentioned before. So let me give you another kind of really basic example that I think defines this really well. So one of the things that we noticed while modeling Lombardi is that there is a very um, different kind of household structure in terms of age groups that are represented in a, in a single household, especially in comparison to the US. So in Lombardy and in a lot of parts of the Mediterranean, it's not uncommon to have three generations living in one house, to have adult children living with their parents. And so this is obviously much less common here in the US. Now, what that means, though, is that the mixing across age groups is different in Lombardy than, say, it is in New York City. So in a place like Lombardy, it might make more sense for the age group that has the most contact with other sorts of age groups, which would kind of be this middle-aged age group, people who have children and also have adult parents living with them inside of a home, that would be the best group to, to ask to shelter in place. Whereas in the US or in New York City specifically, that age group might be totally different. And so these are the kinds of, I think, anthropological and demographic issues that we need to be really mindful of when making kind of policy recommendations to different locations because the age group distribution in a household is very, very important for COVID-19 transmission. That's something that we're starting to learn. And in general, for infectious diseases, household transmission is really important and it can drive a lot of transmission. But when you start to include things like multi-generational households, that definitely changes who you should be targeting the intervention towards. And one of the things that we're doing right now, actually, is we're starting to investigate, for example, should households size play a role in who we should vaccinate first, because that's another really interesting piece of all of this where smaller households and larger households have different operational risk in terms of their likelihood of actually somebody contracting SARS-CoV-2 and then spreading it to everybody else. So there's a lot of really interesting work right now, I think, at the intersection of demography and epidemiology that needs to be pursued further to better understand who we should be making different intervention recommendations to. Terrific. Uh, I have several more questions. I'll just ask one, and uh, then we can continue with the rest of your presentation. 
and then we'll come back to the questions. I'm gonna read this one for you uh, because it's a little longer. There appears to be little public understanding of the use of engineering controls to reduce the spread of COVID-19 by owners of public buildings. Yes. An ASHRAE engineer was asked to join uh, President-elect Biden's COVID-19 advisory board that now only consists of medical personnel. How yes. else can we educate governmental agencies to consider the use of engineering controls using existing technology and off-the-shelf equipment as important tools to prevent the spread of this virus? That's a great question. So for those on the line who may not be aware of what the asker is referring to with engineering controls, this could include things like humidifiers, it could include things like better ventilation, this sort of thing. So things in the environment that you can control in your built environment that might reduce the transmission of a disease. And so what's interesting about this is, you know, hospitals, especially in high income countries are designed to incorporate engineering controls to reduce transmission of viruses and bacteria within the circumstances, the environmental circumstances where care is taking place. So one of the questions becomes, you know, how do we translate this into not only publicly owned buildings, but also the day to day homes and households of individuals and the population. So I think one thing that's very interesting that we should be learning from is there has been quite a bit of work with engineering controls for flu reduction for even the average household. So there's a, a really great paper that I'm thinking of that was actually written by my uh, thesis advisor Dick Larson, uh, who is, you know, an operations research guru, who uh, really kind of wrote out this entire packet of information about how to prevent transmission of influenza when you have somebody in your household who is sick with flu. And so this was a really interesting paper to me because it broke down kind of all of what we understand about the environmental pathways that viruses may use to kind of improve their, their transmission in human populations and broke that down into things that you know, the average person could then use to keep their household safe, even if there's somebody sick at home. And so I think we need more, I think we need more research of this kind where we're breaking down these recommendations, the things that, that we're learning about, the environmental factors that might affect the transmission of a virus that breaks these things down into decisions that are easier to make, not just for individuals who own public buildings, but also for people who own houses and homes and who might be living in an apartment with poor ventilation or that might be very, very dry and arid. And these sorts of things I think are, are really promising avenues to, to better kind of counteract this virus. I think one thing that I'll add though, you know, uh, uh, my group, published a paper a couple of weeks ago now. And uh, in that paper, we examined whether or not, whether mediated seasonality was going to be likely with, with this uh, new coronavirus. And one of the things that we've seen around the world is that even hot humid places have not been spared from this particular pandemic. And we've seen that here in the summertime too. And so what that means, I think, is that, you know, the things that we know about flu, for example, that, you know, humidity can impact the transmissibility of the influenza virus. We're not totally sure about this yet with the novel coronavirus. So we have to make some assumptions. But I think at the same time, one of the things that we should consider is that human behavior plays a major role in seasonality. So the fact that in the wintertime and the cold months, uh, especially say here in New England, people congregate more indoors. That's, an, I mean, inevitably going to increase transmission risk, that sort of thing. And we do know that, you know, hum humidifiers improve lung health. So perhaps we should be engaging and using humidifiers, even if we don't fully understand the relationship between humidity and coronavirus transmission. Uh, other things that we know are that improved HVAC and ventilation is better for general health. So I think that also kind of selling these engineering controls as a way to improve general health is perhaps the better approach. Because I think that one of the things that repeatedly comes up is, do we have enough science to defend recommending this or prescribing this for direct counteractive activity against the pandemic. And I think in other, in another way to kind of look at this would be, how do we improve general health in our 
in our built environments? How do we make healthier buildings in general? And so I think that's uh, perhaps a better way to argue around this, especially when it comes to epidemiologists like myself who might wonder, you know, do we really have a mechanistic explanation for why humidity might uh, influence the transmission of this particular coronavirus? I think that these sorts of questions are very difficult to answer and they usually take a lot of years to answer and we don't necessarily have that kind of time. So instead, packaging engineering controls as a way to improve general health in our built environment might be a better approach, at least across the disciplines who have to make decisions together when it comes to advising the general public about how to prevent uh, coronavirus transmission. Terrific. Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, we'll stop the Q&A session now and uh, we continue with the second part of your presentation. So I'm going to stop my video and go mute and you can share your screen and carry on with the rest of your talk. Thank you. Fantastic. Okay. All right, great. So uh, let's get restarted. Okay, so the second uh, paper that I'm going to be discussing today is another research area of interest at the intersection of machine learning and the COVID-19 pandemic, which is natural language processing for a bibliometric analysis. As I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, my group became particularly interested in understanding the evolution of research pertaining to COVID-19 due to how rapidly studies, including our own, have been produced in response to the myriad knowledge gaps that exist due to the novelty of the pandemic. More specifically, we were interested in answering three specific questions. First, given that COVID-19 has caused a multi-million casualty pandemic and related coronavirus diseases like Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, or MERS, and severe acute respiratory syndrome, SARS, thus far have not, does the research that's been produced to date for COVID-19, especially given the speed at which it's been produced, differ in some way from the research that's been produced for MERS and SARS? Second, what fields or topics are thus far overrepresented or underrepresented in the COVID-19 literature that has been published, either as peer-reviewed papers or as preprints, which are research reports that are distributed through servers on the internet to allow for early dissemination of scientific findings prior to the peer review process. And finally, how is the focus of COVID-19 research, namely the topics and fields investigated, changing over the course of the pandemic? There are a lot of really cool results I want to share today from this particular study that address these three questions. So I'll only offer a very cursory look at the methodology we used in this particular study before jumping into our findings. That said, the paper is cited at the bottom of the slide through, for those who might want to dig into more of the technical aspects. Okay, to start addressing our questions of interest, we turn to something called the COVID Open Research Dataset or CORD-19, a growing resource of scientific papers on COVID-19 and related historical coronavirus research, such as research about MERS and SARS. As of May 28th, 2020, CORD-19 was comprised of over 130,000 research papers. To save computing time, we decided to restrict our analysis to abstracts. And of the research papers in the data set, about 100,000 had abstracts available for analysis. Among these, about 35,000 mentioned coronaviruses explicitly in the abstract, indicating that the paper itself was about coronaviruses, rather than simply referencing coronaviruses in passing or in the citation list. Over half of these coronavirus abstracts were about COVID-19. The remaining fraction referenced other coronavirus diseases like MERS and SARS instead. After the filtering process shown on the previous slide, we used the resulting 18,412 COVID-19 abstracts and the 16,869 abstracts mentioning SARS and MERS as a source text or corpus of documents for our analysis. Natural language processing was implemented on these 35,000 abstracts in two different ways. First, we conducted dim dimensionality reduction using principal component analysis, abbreviated as PCA. PCA identifies patterns of variance or principal components, abbreviated as PCs, that differentiate documents from one another, highlighting key trends in the data. Uh, one example that I'd like to give is in a simple corpus with two mutually exclusive topics, such as machine learning and public health, the terms machine and learning would be correlated with one another. PCA would recognize these terms as an important source of variation, providing a way to differentiate documents about either topic, machine learning versus public health, for example, by frequency of these terms. 
Following PCA, we conducted topic modeling using latent Dirichlet allocation, abbreviated as LDA as well. LDA is an unsupervised probabilistic algorithm that extracts hidden topics from large volumes of text. Once trained to discover words that separate documents into a given number of topics, LDA can estimate the mixture of topics associated with each document, or in our case, scientific abstract. These mixtures suggest that the dominant topic for a, to a document that is then used to assign a document to an overarching topic category. One of the examples that I like to use in this situation is LDA may separate documents into two topics, one on machine learning and another on public health. And if a particular document's mixture is 60% machine learning and 40% public health, it would assign that document to a machine learning topic category. Findings from our dimensionality reduction via PCA suggest that the second principal component does a nicer job of differentiating literature about COVID-19 from literature about MERS and SARS, shown on the right. It's worth noting that earlier PCs usually capture more variants than latter PCs. However, in this case, we see that PC2 captures more variants because certain aspects of the pre-computation processing weren't conducted for the purposes of computational feasibility, as is detailed at length in the supplemental information that accompanies the study. To better understand, however, what kinds of terms were driving the divergence we saw in PC2 between COVID-19 abstracts and abstracts pertaining to MERS and SARS, we examined the component values of the top 50 words on PC2. Here, we see that on the left, lemmatized terms including words like patient, case, and the root hospit, which might represent words like hospital or hospitalization, are, uh, you know, again, very far on the left. Meanwhile, on the right, lemmatized terms include words like virus, cell, and protein. Notably in PCA, words with component values of the greatest magnitude on each PC most strongly drive the pattern that each individual PC recognizes. Here, this means that PC2 detects a pattern such that when protein appears in the text, patient appears less often. To learn more from the lemmatized key terms on the previous slide, we sorted them by their PC2 component values and then examined the percentage of COVID-19 abstracts and the percentage of MERS and SARS abstracts that mentioned each word. Here, COVID-19 abstracts are shown in orange and non-COVID-19 or MERS and SARS abstracts are shown in blue. It's immediately obvious that COVID-19 abstracts are overrepresented on the left-hand side, the side that includes words like patient and case, and underrepresented on the right-hand side, the side that includes words like protein and cell. Given that terms like protein and cell are more likely to appear in lab-based research, and terms like patient and case are more likely to appear in clinical modeling and field-based research, this suggests that lab-based research during COVID-19 may be underrepresented to date when compared against MERS and SARS. Digging deeper, topic modeling via LDA also suggests stark differences in the topics covered by COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 related abstracts to date when compared against abstracts pertaining to other coronaviruses. 30 topics emerged as shown above, and five of these, first, topic 14, outbreaks impact on healthcare services. Second, topic 15, testing for coronaviruses. Third, topic 17, epidemic cases and modeling. Fourth, topic 21, clinical care and therapeutics. And fifth, topic 25, lessons learned for epidemic preparedness, accounted for 58% of all COVID-19 abstracts and just 17% of MERS and SARS abstracts. In other words, COVID-19 abstracts were disproportionately concentrated in these five topics relative to non-COVID-19 abstracts. We were also able to group the 30 topics that emerged into a few topic families, uh, namely, one, clinical issues, testing and diagnostics, two, societies and outbreaks, responses to mitigate them and their impact on our society, three, basic microbiological study, four, general outbreak reporting, and five, modeling disease transmission. Temporal analysis of these topic families over time indicates that publications between January 2020 and through the end of May 2020 were dominated by studies involving outbreak response in patients and healthcare services with no sign of slowdown. Publications regarding viral mechanisms and biomolecular processes related to SARS-CoV-2 grew at a slower pace during this time period. And these results remain consistent when we re-ran our bibliometric analysis pipeline with data through July 2020 as well. 
This suggests that as of this past summer, COVID-19 research has been dominated by clinical modeling and field-based investigation, whereas lab-based studies have lagged behind. With the help of colleagues and collaborators who conduct lab-based science, we were able to determine that the most likely cause for the lag in lab-based research for COVID-19 is due to massive federal funding cuts that basic science labs have experienced over the last few years. In other words, these lags are not at all the fault of basic scientists. Instead, they represent insufficient resources to do work that is essential to pandemic response, including development of improved diagnostics and condition-specific therapeutics. As a result, one of our primary policy recommendations coming out of the study is the need for federal funding mechanisms to prioritize lab-based research both in the short term for emergent crises like the ongoing pandemic and through long-term mechanisms to enable a position of preparedness for future emergent crises. Since publication of this study, numerous lab scientists have reached out to my group and thanked us for providing quantitative evidence for their anecdotal experiences, which they hope will help motivate reevaluation and redistribution of federal funding to lab-based research activities. Indeed, we foresee that our bibliometric analysis pipeline can be utilized by federal funding agencies over time to identify possible special interest areas too, including persistently understudied topics not only in basic science, but within clinical modeling and field based science as well. As a result, we are keeping our pipeline up to date and will continue running it on the CORD-19 data set for the foreseeable future to see what else we can learn about the information we're creating in response to the pandemic. We also plan to expand our bibliometric analysis pipeline to include clinical trial abstracts to unearth potentially understudied outcomes associated with COVID-19, such as the long-term effects of COVID-19, which to date remain poorly understood and have often been overshadowed by effects associated with therapeutics that are currently undergoing trials. Beyond bibliometric analyses, we would also like to further examine CORD-19 and other scientific literature databases using network science techniques to investigate the COVIDization of public health research. COVIDization of research may be defined as the phenomenon in which researchers who have not previously studied pandemics, epidemics, or coronaviruses are pivoting towards COVID-19 research for a whole host of reasons, varying from the availability of emergency funding to things that are less uh, positive, like opportunism. However, given the importance of domain expertise and experience in conducting research about COVID-19, the COVIDization of public health research has the potential to result in information generation that maliciously or otherwise doubles as misinformation propagation, as is showcased by several high profile retractions that have taken place since the beginning of the pandemic from some fairly uh, big playing journals. And I think that, uh, in general, this really feeds us fairly well into the, the next study that I'll be covering. So, of course, uh, poorly executed scientific studies aren't the only source of misinformation that plagues the pandemic, which leads us to the third and final study that I'll be covering today. In the broad research area of utilizing novel digital disease data for event-specific surveillance, this paper focuses on the public health impacts associated with a misinformation event that I'm sure many of us are all too familiar with. President Trump's April 23rd remarks regarding the off-label use of disinfectants as a COVID-19 therapeutic. For those who may need a refresher, let me read President Trump's remarks for you now verbatim. I see the disinfectant where it knocks it out in a minute, one minute. And is there a way we can do something like that by injection inside or almost a cleaning? Because you see it gets in the lungs and it does a tremendous number on the lungs. So it would be interesting to check that so that you're going to have to use medical doctors with, but it sounds, it sounds interesting to me. Following April 23rd, my research group was interested in answering three specific questions. First, how did President Trump's remarks impact the behavior of the general public which, with respect to interest in purchasing, injecting, or drinking disinfectants? Second, how long did the impact of his remarks last? And finally, was this misinformation event associated with population level increases and in adverse health effects, such as poisonings? Like the bibliometric study, there are a wealth of fascinating findings that we discovered through this investigation. So I'll keep my discussion of the methods fairly brief and focus primarily on the results. However, please feel free to read the paper cited at the bottom of the slide, which was published in the Lancet Digital Health and the technical appendix if you'd like to learn more. 
To start addressing this question, we first turned to internet search query data from Google to get a handle on what kinds of disinfectants the general public was searching for, both before and after April 23rd. Google search query data are fractional and relative. When interest in a term reaches a peak for a given time period, this means that the term was most popular at that point in time. And whichever term in a series of terms was most popular among them peaks at 100. Here we can see that Lysol was the most popular term among the nine disinfectants considered and that it peaked around April 23rd. Other popular disinfectants included bleach and Clorox with the remainder peeling away from the pack and lingering towards the bottom. With our initial search query analysis under our belts, we curated a set of search terms to represent four topics of interest, purchasing, drinking, and injecting disinfectants, as well as poison control, a proxy indicator for possible poisonings following the off-label consumption of disinfectants. As is clear from the search terms considered, we chose to focus on the three most popular disinfectants that appeared to peak around April 23rd, Lysol, bleach, and Clorox. We pulled data from Google search trends for these search terms, but we also pulled news media data pertaining to these topics as well, so that we could implement a debiasing procedure to separate interest in President Trump's remarks due to media generated interest from true interest in the off label use of disinfectants. The autoregressive machine learning procedure designed to debias the search query data of media generated interest is detailed at length in the supplementary materials that accompany this paper for those who may be interested. There is also a full length preprint about this particular method that is cited within the citations of this paper. Prior to debiasing the search query data of media generated interest, we plotted our raw search query data and the results which are shown here were pretty stunning. The action oriented searches that reflected off label use of disinfectants, namely drinking and injecting disinfectants, peaked immediately following Trump's April 23rd remarks. Then, rather damningly, interest in poison control peaked the very next day. Results that are unfortunately consistent with poisoning reports subsequently noted by the American Association of Poison Control Centers. Moreover, interest in these topics remained increased for an entire week following the misinformation event, suggesting that while most of the associated impact on population level behaviors occurred soon after the event itself, the impact did not dissipate immediately. Though debiasing to minimize the news media generated interest in these topics marginally blunted results across the topics of interest, as is shown in the four charts here, the overarching trends described in the previous slides remain consistent even after we debias to minimize the news media generated interest in these topics. Though we can't infer causation from this work, the fact that internet search interest in poison control centers peaked after queries regarding off-label use of disinfectants suggests that search query data could be used as an early warning surveillance system for poison control centers in the future, a need that may be increasingly dire as false cures for COVID-19 continue to be propagated by those in positions of power. Which brings us to the policy recommendations that my research group made following this study. First and foremost, science communication at multiple scales will be necessary to combat sources of misinformation, including the White House, at least until Inauguration Day. Second, a surveillance system for public health misinformation should be established using novel digital data sources that allow us to monitor population level behaviors following misinformation events. By designing such a system specifically for healthcare and safety service providers, decision-making tools like the early warning system for poison control centers I just mentioned can be effectively brought to fruition. With an eye towards establishing a surveillance system for public health misinformation, my research group is currently pursuing a geographic analysis to accompany the temporal analysis presented today to uncover spatial heterogeneities and population level behaviors and thus vulnerability following misinformation events, as well as sociodemographic risk factors that accompany such vulnerability to enable hotspot prediction of adverse health effects in response to misinformation events. We're also working on incorporating additional data streams, such as Reddit, to glean deeper insights into behavioral impacts following other misinformation events, such as falsely purported pharmaceutical therapeutics and black market purchasing of such products. 
Now on that note, uh, thank you all so much for listening. I know I've covered a lot of material today, but I hope that the three studies I covered have effectively showcased a sampling of the advances that machine learning can achieve within the context of the ongoing pandemic and public health more broadly. Now I'd be very happy to answer a few more questions over Zoom and please don't hesitate to reach out over Twitter or email as well. Thank you all very much. Dr. Majumdar, thank you again. I am back, but I don't see my own picture. Let me see what is going on here. Yes, very good. Uh, this was fascinating. You did cover a lot and uh, you probably do know uh, you speak at an incredibly high baud rate. So that combination makes it uh, for a fascinating and uh, information rich uh, presentation. Um, I, I'd like to invite the audience to send their questions through the same Q&A tool, but I already have a few questions from, um, from the first round plus a, a couple of additional ones. So let me, um, <clears throat> all right, let me start with a question that goes like this. Do you know if anyone has investigated the use of focused communications? to the more at-risk groups that, um, that you've identified, uh, such as groups identified by age or co comorbidities, et cetera, via various means such as public service announcements, Twitter, uh, or things like that regarding the availability of hospital service to slow the virus's spread via reduced human interactivity. This is a great question. I think that this is a particularly interesting question because it applies to a lot of different things. So first of all, it applies, as you suggest, to targeted public health messaging for individuals who may be at risk for particularly bad outcomes if they contract SARS-CoV-2. But it also applies, for example, to targeted public health interventions for folks who may be vulnerable to misinformation about the pandemic. So this is a, a particularly useful tool for a lot of different applications in public health. And so in public health, you know, uh, before, before I went to do my PhD, I did go to public health school. One of the things that I learned during my master's in public health is that this idea of risk communication that's specific to the at-risk group is really, really vitally important. And it's something that is, I would consider in many ways, a core tenant of public health communication. I think that the struggle is that in the early days of the pandemic, we were still trying to understand who might be at risk. So now we know that individuals with certain comorbidities and uh, individuals that are older might have certain risks that you know, predispose them to poor outcomes. But I think one thing that's really difficult for this pandemic is that young people play a role too. And I think that what's really hard is that young people tend to have more contacts than older people, especially in the US. And they usually have a more diverse set of contacts outside of the household and inside of the household compared to other age groups. So we're talking about folks who aren't uh, in K through 12, but we're talking about folks who are in college and are young. And so this has been a particularly difficult challenge where I think that the message about the individuals who are at particularly high risk for poor outcomes, I think that that message has been properly targeted. I think that there are quite a few campaigns that, that aim, uh, for example, pharmaceutical companies uh, are currently thinking about you know, older folks and whether we should vaccinate them first. You know, this identification of older individuals as being at high risk, it's been it's been implemented not only through public health interventions for communicating risk and communicating things that can help decrease risk using non pharmaceutical interventions, but these folks are also being considered as individuals who should be among the first to be vaccinated. So I think that in terms of getting getting the word out that you know certain individuals are at more risk, I think that that's happening. That's happening both from the non pharmaceutical intervention point of view and from the pharmaceutical intervention point of view. What has been more challenging is targeting young adults and asking them to sacrifice their day-to-day -day lives and behaviors for the health and safety of others in the population. And I think that's been particularly challenging. And I think it is really hard in, in some cultures, especially in American culture, where we have a, a pretty serious idea of, of individualism, that we should make sacrifices for other members of our population. And I think that one of the ways that folks are trying to get around that is that we're highlighting the fact that not all young people survive this disease and that though there 
less likely to die from it, deaths do happen in young adults. And we're not totally sure what predisposes some young healthy adults to death versus others. We don't know yet. And so by highlighting these cases, we can start to, to make young adults feel like, oh, this might happen to me too. Because I think so far, unfortunately, this idea of keeping your elders safe has not been a, a successful solution for the American population, at least. And I think that that's quite sad and also telling about our about our culture. But I think that that's one way by kind of making it more about the, the group that's at risk or that you're trying to target. And I think another thing is also, you know, I, I mentioned briefly the long-term effects of even mild cases of COVID. And I think that we're starting to learn more about that. So we're starting to learn that in young adults, even though they might be more likely to get mild cases, they may have symptoms for now, you know, nine months. I, I have some friends and colleagues who got sick on the front lines who are still experiencing symptoms following infection. And they think that drawing more attention to that might be more effective, at least for the young adult group who are in some ways still living life as normal. And I think that really thinking about, you know, what groups are at risk for bad outcomes, that's one group, but also what risk is associated with certain age groups who have large numbers of contacts and trying to understand that the risk of causing more transmissions is sometimes different from the risk of causing more deaths. And I think that who we target for these two different objective functions is often different. Interesting. Um, and thank you. Uh, this next question is related to uh, uh, the uh, study that you conducted uh, that correlated uh, kind of public reaction or public response to information that comes from positions of authority or, or influence. So specifically the question is, does your research identify group or ethnicities that were most affected by the April 23rd statement? That's a great question. So one of the things that we're doing right now as a follow-up to this you know, very preliminary temporal analysis is we're looking at what areas in the US seemed to have the strongest signal in response to April 23rd. So this is a this is a situation where it's, you know, it's very interesting. Google search trends allows you to do some pretty deep analysis using kind of metropolitan areas, using Nielsen DMAs that can yield a lot of information about, say, for example, what types of cities might have been more vulnerable. And so from there, what we can start to look at is what is the ethnic breakdown of these cities? What is the age breakdown of these cities? What is the education breakdown of these cities? And so these are some of the, the forward areas of research that we're currently pursuing. I don't have any concrete results yet, but I would definitely encourage the asker to watch this space because this is precisely a question that we're trying to answer right now using biostatistical methods. So I think it should be really interesting to see. And it's another really interesting way to kind of combine machine learning tools with more traditional biostatistical tools to see what we can learn about really complex phenomena like misinformation events. Interesting. We, we would be uh, extremely interested in uh, your findings in this area. Uh, I, I promise that we'll not keep you much uh, beyond five o'clock. It is 5.09. So with your permission, I'll just ask one more question. Is that all right? Sure, of course. So this question is related to uh, an issue, a topic that you haven't covered, uh, but I'm sure you have an opinion about it. And that's uh, a topic that everybody's interested in, that's vaccines. So the question goes like this, given the shortage of the number of vaccine doses in the next few months, can we use AI-based methods to guide the vaccination campaigns and set priorities ge geographically and among uh, different age groups uh, with the goal to reduce transmission as fast as possible? Yes, absolutely. So this is an area where we are actually using the agent-based model that I presented today, and we're making some tweaks and adjustments to it to start figuring out what happens if you vaccinate a certain portion of this age group versus that age group, or perhaps more importantly, if you vaccinate this, uh, this group of workers versus this other group of workers. And so one of the things that's happening right now that is really fascinating is that, you know, the, the pharmaceutical companies that are kind of at the forefront of developing the three candidates that have showed the most promising efficacy results in the last couple of weeks, I think that one of the things that's happening is that they have become increasingly open to this idea of how do we use newer techniques in artificial intelligence, such as machine learning, to 
better allocate the resources that we do have. And so this is absolutely an area that we're working in right now. And I think that it's a really interesting example of what machine learning can do when it's combined with domain expertise in both vaccine deployment, which has all these supply chain and operations research issues associated with it, as well as with public health and more specifically infectious disease epidemiology. So one of the things that I'm particularly interested in is I'm sure many of the folks on the line have been following this. There are different temperatures that these vaccines need to be stored at. And so what that means is that some vaccines will be easier to distribute than others to different parts of the US, for example, or to different parts of the world. So one of the things that I'm very interested in is how do we distribute doses of different types of vaccines in a way that optimizes the number of people that can be reached? And so there's a lot of really interesting research that kind of is a precursor to all of this that has happened in, in operations research, which is part of where my background is from for my PhD. And I think that thinking about how we can combine all of these different disciplines to answer this question bust is going to be really important. And one last thing that I'll say is, you know, we, we talk a lot about herd immunity and the fact that if you vaccinate enough people, you will reach herd immunity. And that's what we want, because then that will reduce the number of sustained transmission events that happen in the US. And we, we can start to go back to a relatively normal life. But I think another really interesting thing to consider that, you know, AI can help us better understand is not everybody is as likely to pass on SARS-CoV-2 as others. So this idea of transmission heterogeneity, the fact that we're not all the same and thus we have different risks, not only in terms of contracting the disease, but also passing it on. How do we use this to optimize our understanding of who to vaccinate? I think is the next is the next big horizon, understanding risk-based immunization, which is part of what the ASPR is getting at and this understanding that some people may be more at risk than others. And so a really interesting thing happens when you start to vaccinate people who are at very high risk, you start to see a really precipitous drop in transmission, even without vaccinating the percentage of the population that you might think that you need to, to meet herd immunity. And so really taking advantage of kind of our understanding of the, the probability associated with different types of, of transmission events is going to really help us with this. So this idea of how do we vaccinate folks who we think might be involved in a super spreading event is uh, really kind of top at mind right now to, to utilize our resources the best that we can. Well, this is uh, obviously most encouraging and extremely interesting. I hope we can find answers to some of these questions before the deployment of the vaccine either begins or uh, or goes into a large scale deployment so that it's really a resource uh, allocation problem, right? How do you allocate yes. your resources optimally to get the best result? And the sooner we get the best result, the happier the entire world will be. Uh, this talk has been uh, nothing short of uh, fascinating. I, I want to thank you on behalf of all of our <clears throat> faculty, staff, students, and many visitors who've been on, uh, on this webinar for uh, sharing your results, uh, for doing this phenomenal work, uh, for uh, allowing us to benefit from your experience and wisdom. And uh, I hope maybe on the other side of the pandemic, you'll get a chance to come visit our campus. Oh, uh, I would love that. Thank you so very much and have a good evening. Thank you for having me. Thank you, bye-bye.